once again back to Exploring Arda, a Tolkien-centered podcast where I am your host, Jackson, and I go through a bunch of Tolkien's works other than Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And yeah, today is going to be a, uh, a different, uh, one of the shorter stories, but before we get into that, uh, check out firstly my book called The Lands of Ordia, Power of Heaven, and also check out um, the Bookworm Cinema Productions uh, channel on YouTube and also on some platforms. Uh, some podcast platforms. There you go. I can definitely talk <laughs> uh, to check out my other couple of podcasts that I do with my friends. So I would greatly appreciate that. And uh, another final thing before we get into the book is that I had a really, really fun time actually being a guest <laughs> on another podcast called the Witching Hours podcast. Uh, check their channel out because I had a re- I had a fun time, had an absolute blast on their channel, um, and I actually got to talk a lot about uh, Tolkien stuff, uh, the spirituality that involves Tolkien's um, creation, and a lot of it came from the Silmarillion. <laughs> so check that out if you guys want still more Silmarillion. I don't know why my hair is acting up as soon as I get on camera, but check their channel out uh, if you can. I'll put a little link in the description, and I hope this doesn't bother me the whole episode. So, <laughs> But check all that stuff out. I'd greatly appreciate it. Now that we've got through all that, all the introductions out of the way, uh, yeah, this is going to be a part one out of the story called Rolverandum, and I can barely get the, there it is, uh, if I tilt it the right way. Yes, Rolverandum. So this is a story that I've read before, but it was like a long time ago. So this is kind of a, uh, kind of a, I think it was Smith of Wood and Major that I read before, so this channel's very much like, let's read it again, because it's a fun tale, so. This is part one. I don't know how many parts it will take to get through the story. It's very short, as you can see, compared to all the other stories that we've done. So, um, yeah. First, before we get into the story, uh, I have this like little uh, side thing in the book here that, oh man, the glare is terrible on this now. <laughs> uh, there you go, if I tilt it the right way. I'm gonna be reading this little insert here to get a proper introduction to what the story is all about. So. Here we go. In 1925, while on vacation with his family on the Yorkshire coast, four-year-old Michael Tolkien lost his favorite toy, a little lead dog he was reluctant to put down even in play on the beach. To console and distract him, his father, J.R.R. Tolkien, improvised a story, the story of Rover, a real dog magically transformed into a toy who, after many fantastic adventures in search of the wizard who wronged him, at last wins back his doggy life. This charming tale, uh, peopled by a terrible dragon and a wise old whale, by the king of the sea and the man in the moon, was a Tolkien family favorite and went through several uh, typewritten drafts over the years. In 1936, Tolkien submitted it to his British publishers as a possible follow-up to The Hobbit. Uh, What his publishers really wanted, however, was a sequel, so he set aside this little book to begin his masterwork, The Lord of the Rings. Now, more than 70 years after it was written, the story of Rover, or as the Man on the Moon finally called him, Roverandom, is published at last, together with five illustrations by the author. Rich in wit and wordplay, crowded with thrilling and humorous incident, Roverandom will delight not only Tolkien's countless admirers, but anyone who loves a rollicking yarn well told. So, that's kind of like what it's all about, and uh, before I actually do anything, the heat kicked in. So I'm going to pause it really quick before I go into anything else. Okay, and we're back now. So hopefully that is just a brief little pause here. And yeah, I got a hat because I I would not, I I just don't want my hair to get in the way. So Uh, I think with that proper introduction out of the way, I think we'll just go right into the story here. So here we go. Roll random, chapter one. It just has one on it, but you know, pretty much chapter one. So let's do it. Once upon a time, there was a little dog, and his name was Rover. He was very small and very young, or he would have known better. And he was very happy playing in the garden in the sunshine with a yellow ball, or or he would never have done what he did. Not every old man with ragged trousers is a bad old man. Some are bone and bottle men, and have little dogs of their own. And some are gardeners. And a few, a very few, are wizards prowling round on a holiday looking for something to do. This one was a wizard, the one that now walked with the story. He came wandering up the garden path in a ragged old coat, with an old pipe in his mouth, and an old green hat on his head. 
If Rover had not been so busy barking at the ball, he might have noticed the blue feather stuck in the back of the green hat, and then he would have suspected that the man was a wizard, as any other sensible little dog would, but he never saw the feather at all. When the old man stooped down and picked up the ball, he was thinking of turning it into an orange, or even a bone, or a piece of meat for Rover. Rover growled and said, put it down, with ever a please. Of course, the wizard, being a wizard, understood perfectly and answered back, be quiet, silly, without ever a please. Then he, then he put the ball in his pocket, just to tease the dog, and turned away. I'm sorry to say that Rover immediately bit his trousers, and tore out quite a piece. Perhaps he also tore out a piece of the wizard. Anyway, the old man suddenly turned round very angry and shouted, Idiot! Go and be a toy! After that, the most peculiar things began to happen. Rover was only a little dog to begin with, but he suddenly felt very much smaller. The grass seemed to suddenly seem... Wow! Oh, I missed that there. The grass seemed to grow monstrously tall and way far above his head, and a long way away through the grass, like the sun rising through the trees of a forest. He could see the huge yellow ball, where the wizard had thrown it down again. He heard the gate click as the old man went out, but he could not see him. He tried to bark, but only a little tiny noise came out, too small for ordinary people to hear, and I don't suppose even a dog would have noticed it. So small had he become that I am sure, if a cat had come along just then, she would have thought Rover was a mouse and would have eaten him. Tinker would. Tinker was the large black cat that lived in the same house. At the very thought of Tinker, Rover began to feel thoroughly frightened, but cats were soon put right out of his mind. The garden came about him, suddenly vanished, and Rover felt himself whisked off. He didn't know where. When the rush was over, he found he was in the dark, lying against a lot of hard things and there he lay in a stuffy box by the feel of it, very uncomfortably for a long while. He had nothing to eat or drink, but worst of all, he found he could not move. At first he thought this was because he had packed so tight, but afterwards he discovered that in the daytime he could only move very little and with great effort, and then only when no one was looking. Only after midnight could he walk and wag his tail, and a bit stiffly at that. He had become a toy. And because he had not said please to the wizard, now all day long he had to sit up and beg, and he was fixed like that. All right, a little bit of an intro. So <laughs> yes, this is a very whimsical tale. <laughs> and it's kind of funny that pretty much Rover is being just an ordinary dog and at the rude, <laughs> I guess, uh, things that the wizard does is just, the dog just does a normal thing and the wizard's just like, you know what? You're a toy now, so, and that's his curse. <laughs> and that's kind of like how we get the start of it right away. So right to the point, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's a whimsical, crazy tale. So what do you expect, you know? So, and yeah, he realized that, yeah, he is a toy because he has a lot of stiff movements during the day. And he can't move literally unless of somebody, like if somebody's watching him. So uh, kind of like the, the premise of Toy Story in a way. <laughs> but back to the story again. After what seemed a very long, dark time, he tried once more to bark loud enough to make people hear. Then he tried to bite the other things in the box with him, stupid little toy animals, really only made of wood or lead, not enchanted real box like Rover. But it was no good. He could not bark or bite. Suddenly, someone came and took off the lid of the box and let in the light. We had better put a few of these animals in the window this morning, Harry, said a voice, and a hand came into the box. Where did this one come from, said the voice, as the hand took hold of Rover. I don't remember seeing this one before. It's no business in the three penny box, I'm sure. Did you ever see anything so real looking? Look at its fur and its eyes. Mark him sixpence, said Harry, and put him in the front of the window. There in the front of the window in the hot sun, poor little Rover had to sit all morning and all the afternoon till nearly tea time. And all the while he had to sit up and pretend to beg, though really in his inside he was very angry indeed. I'll run away from the very first people that buy me, he said to the other toys. I'm real. I'm not a toy, and I won't be a toy. But I wish someone would come and buy me quick. I hate this shop, and I can't move all stuck up in the window like this. What do you want to move for, said the other toys. We don't. It's more comfortable standing still thinking of nothing. The more you rest, the longer you live. So just shut up. <laughs> we can't sleep while you're talking, and these are hard times in rough nurseries in front of some of us. They would not say any more, so poor Rover had no one at all to talk to, and he was very miserable, and very sorry he had bitten the wizard's trousers. I could not say whether it was the wizard or not who sent the mother to take the little dog away from the shop. 
Anyway, just when Rover was feeling his miserablest, <laughs> miserablest, hmm, okay, into the shop, she walked with a shopping basket. She had never seen Ro Rover through the window and thought what a nice little dog he would be for her boy. She had three boys, and one was particularly fond of little dogs, especially of little black and white dogs. So she, so she bought Rover, and he was screwed up in the paper and put in her basket among the things she had been buying for tea. Rover soon managed to wriggle his head out of the paper. He smelled cake, but he found he could, he could not get at it. And right down there among the paper bags, he growled a little toy growl. Only the shrimps heard him, and they asked him what was the matter. He told them all about it and expected them to be very sorry for him. But they only said, how would you like to be boiled? Have you ever been boiled? No, I have never been boiled, as far as I remember, said Rover, though I have sometimes been bathed, and that is not particularly nice. But I expect boiling isn't half as bad as being bewitched. Then you have certainly never been boiled, they answered. You know nothing about it. It's the very worst thing that could happen to anyone. We are still red with rage at the very idea. Rover did not like the shrimps, so he said, Never mind, they will soon eat you up, and I shall sit and watch them. <laughs> very cruel. <laughs> wow. Okay. After that, the shrimps had no more to say to him, yeah, and he was left to lie and wonder what sort of people had bought him. He soon found out. He was carried to a house, and the basket was set down on a table, and all the parcels were taken out. The shrimps were taken off to the larder, but Rover was given straight away to the little boy he had been bought for, who took him into the nursery and talked to him. Rover would have liked the little boy if he had not been too angry to listen to what he was saying to him. The little boy barked at him in the best dog language he could manage. He was rather good at it. But Rover never tried to answer. All the time he was thinking he said he had said he would run away from the first people that bought him, and he was wondering how he could do it. And all the time he had to sit up and pretend to beg, while the little boy patted him and pushed him about over the table and along the floor. As at, at last night came, and the little boy went to bed, and Rover was put on a chair by the bedside still begging until it was quite dark. The blind was down, but outside the, outside the moon rose up out of the sea and laid the silver path across the waters. That is the best, that is the best way to places at the edge of the world and beyond, for those that can walk on it. The father and mother and the three little boys lived close by the sea in a white house that looked right, o right out over the waves to nowhere. All right, so I'll do a little quick break here. So yeah, he, yeah, Rover gets bought pretty quickly, actually. <laughs> uh, a lot quicker than I uh, remembered, but that's good. And yeah, he has an argument with some shrimps and they're just like, listen, like, you're not, you're not going to your death here. <laughs> Literally to, to the death be because they're going to be boiled. And Rover's just like, you know what? I, I don't like you guys, so I'm going to literally watch you guys die. <laughs> that's what he says to them and they shut up. <laughs> they're like, okay, never mind. <laughs> Which is crazy and like kind of like one of the funniest things <laughs> so far. And it's, I don't know if you really consider it like dark humor or not, but I mean, I don't know. It's just a weird thing to kind of put in a children's story, but yeah. So obviously he gets placed into the possession of the boy, one of the little boys, and he's still thinking of escaping. And this is nighttime. So, you know, always the best time to escape. So, uh, back to the story. When the little boys were asleep, Rubber stretched his tired, stiff legs and gave a little bark that nobody heard except for an old wicker spider up a corner. Then he jumped off, or jumped from the chair to the bed, and from the bed he tumbled off onto the carpet, and then he ran away out of the room and down the stairs and all over the house. Although he was very pleased to be able to move again, and having once been real and properly alive, he could jump and run a good deal better than most toys at night. He found it very difficult and dangerous getting out. Getting about, sorry. He was now so small that going downstairs was almost like jumping off walls, and getting upstairs again was very tiring and awkward indeed. And it was all of no use. He found all the doors shut and locked, of course, and there was not a crack or a hole by which he could not creep out, or could creep out. <laughs> so poor Rover, Rover could not run away that night, and morning found a very tired, very tired little dog sitting up and pretending to beg on the chair, just where he had been left. The two older boys used to get up when it was fine and run along the sands before their breakfast. That morning, when they woke and pulled up the blind, they saw the sun jumping out of the sea, all fiery red with clouds about his head, as if he had a cold bathe and was drying himself with towels. They were soon up and dressed, and off they went down the cliff and 
onto the shore for a walk, and a rover went with them. Just as little boy 2, to whom Rover belonged, was leaving the bedroom, he saw Rover sitting on the chest of drawers where he had put him while he was dressing. He is begging to go out, he said, and put him in his trouser pocket. But Rover, but Rover was not begging to go out, and certainly not in a trouser pocket. He wanted to rest and get ready for the night again, for he thought that this time he might find a way out and escape, and a wander away and away, until he came back to his home and his garden and his yellow ball on the lawn. He had a sort of idea that if once he could get back to the lawn, it might come all right. The enchantment might break, or he might wake up and find it had all been a dream. So, as the little boy scrambled down the cliff path and galloped along the sands, he tried to bark and struggle and wriggle in the pocket. Try how he would, he could only move a very little, even though he was hidden and no one could see him. Still, he did what he could, and luck helped him. There was a handkerchief in the pocket, all crumpled and bundled up, so that Rover was not was not very deep down, and what with his efforts and the galloping of his master, before long he had managed to poke out his nose and have a sniff around. Very surprised he was too at what he smelt and what he saw. He had never he had never either seen or smelt the sea before, and the country village where he had been born was miles and miles from sound or snuff of it. Suddenly, as he was leaning out, a great big bird, all white and gray, went sweeping by just over the heads of the boys, making a noise like a great cat on wings. Rover was so startled that he fell right out of the pocket onto the soft sand, and no one heard him. The great bird flew on and away, never noticing his tiny barks, and the little boys walked on and on along the sands, and never thought about him at all. All right. Another little quick uh, break here, a little update. <laughs> so, Rover has now finally escaped by kind of an accident, I suppose. Uh, I guess he realizes that he is outside of the house anyway, so might as well try to escape that way. <laughs> it only makes sense. So, yeah. And then, obviously, with the, uh, the startling of the bird, as birds are enormous for Rover's view, <laughs> he slides out of the pocket into the sand, and he's out! So... Hooray for Rover with kind of accidentally escaping. I would say accidentally, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, back to it here. Oh, actually, before I go into the story, there is a depiction of the house, I suppose. <laughs> uh, in the There's a house in the hills. I don't know if you guys can see it very well or not, but this is one of uh, Tolkien's depictions, one of his paintings. Uh, I just always love it that Tolkien was not just like a a writer but he was also like an illustrator and a painter he's the, that guy is just so amazing with the creative side obviously as a lot of people know <laughs> so now we can go back into the story at first rover was very pleased with himself i've run away i've run away he barked toy barking that only other toys could have heard and there were none to listen then he rolled over and lay in the clean dry sand that was still cool from lying out all night under the stars but when the little boys went by on their way home and never noticed him, and he was left all alone on the empty shore, he was not quite so pleased. The shore was deserted except by the gulls. Beside the marks of their claws on the sand, the only other footprints to be seen were the tracks of the little boys' feet. That morning they had gone for their walk on a very lonely part of the beach that they seldom visited. Indeed, it was not often that anyone went there, for though the sand was clean and yellow, and the shingle white, and the sea blue with silver foam in a little cove under the gray cliffs, there was a queer feeling there, except just except just as early morning when the sun was new. People said that strange things came there, and even in the afternoon, and by the evening the place was full of mermen and mermaids, oh, sorry, I can't even turn the page, <laughs> not to speak of the smaller sea goblins that rode their small seahorses with bridles of green weed that right up to the cliffs, and left them lying in the foam at the edge of the water. Now the reason of all this queerness was simple. The oldest of all the sand sorcerers lived in that cove. Uh, oh boy. Samoth Samothists. Oh man, that's a interesting word. <laughs> As the sea people called them in their splashing language. Samamo Samothos Samothides. Interesting. Was this one's name. Oof. So, or so he said. And a great fuss he made about the proper pronunciation. There you go. <laughs> but he was a wise old thing, and all sorts of strange folk came to see him, for he was an excellent magician, and very kindly to the right people into the bargain, if a bit crusty on the surface. The merfolk used to laugh over his jokes for weeks after one of his midnight parties, but it was not easy to find him in the daytime. 
You like to lie buried in the warm sand when the warm was shining, so that not more than the tip of one of his long ears stuck out. And even if both of his ears were showing, most people like you and me would have taken them for bits of sticks. It is possible that old Samothos knew all about Rover. He certainly knew the old wizard who had enchanted him, for magicians and wizards are few and far between, and they know one another very well, and keep an eye on one another's doings too, not always being the best of friends in private life. At any rate, there was Rover lying in the soft sand and beginning to feel very lonely and rather queer, and there was Samothos, uh, though Rover did not see him, peeping at him out of the pile of sand that the mermaids had made for him the night before. But the sand sorcerer said nothing, and Rover said nothing, and breakfast time went by and the sun got high and hot. Rover looked at the sea, which sounded cool, and then he had got a horrible fright. At first he thought that the sand must have gotten to his eyes, but soon he saw that there could be no mistake. The sea was moving nearer and nearer, and swallowing up more and more sand, and the waves were getting bigger and bigger and more foamy all the time. The tide was coming in, and Rover was lying just below the high water mark, but he, he did not know anything about that. He grew more and more terrified as he watched, and thought of the splashing waves coming right up the cliffs and washing him away into the foaming sea, far worse than any soapy bathing tub, still miserably begging. That is indeed what might have happened to him, but it did not. I dare say Samothos had something to do with it. At any rate, I imagine that the wizard's spell was not so strong in that queer cove, so close to the residence of another magician. Certainly, when the sea had come very near, and Rover was nearly bu bursting with fright as he struggled to roll a bit further up the beach, he suddenly found he could move. His size was not changed, but he was no longer a toy. He could move quickly and properly with all his legs, daytime though it still was. He, d he need not beg any more, and he could run over the sands where they were harder, and he could bark, not toy barks, but real sharp little fairy do dog barks equal to his fairy dog size. He was so delighted, and he barked so loud, that if you would have been there, you would have heard him then, clear and far away like, like the echo of a sheepdog coming down that wind, the wind in the hills. And then the sorcerer stuck his head out of the sand. He certainly was ugly, and about as big as a very large dog, but to Rover in his enchanted size he looked hideous and monstrous. Rover sat down and stopped barking at once. What are you making such a noise about, little dog? said Samothos Samothides. This is my time for sleep. As a matter of fact, all times were times for him to go to sleep, unless something was going on which amused him, such as a dance with the mermaids in the cove, at his invitation. In that case, he got out of the sand and saw, sat on a rock to see the fun. Mermaids may be very graceful in the water, but when they tried to dance on their tails on the shore, Samothos thought them very comical. Oh, sorry, one of my things kind of went there. All right. This is my time for sleep, he said again, when Rover did not answer. Still, Rover said nothing, and only wagged his tail ap apologetically. Do you know who I am, he asked. I am Samothos Samothides, the chief of all the Samothis. <laughs> he said this several times, very proudly, pronouncing every letter and with every P. Oh, I'm pronouncing it wrong. He blew a cloud of slant sand down, the, down his nose. So I suppose it's Pasamathos? Pasamathos? Okay, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Interesting. Rover was nearly buried in it, and he sat there uh, looking so fright frightened and so unhappy that the sand sorcerer took pity on him. In fact, he suddenly stopped looking fierce and burst out laughing. You are a funny little dog, little dog. Indeed, I don't remember e ever having seen another little dog that was quite such a little dog, little dog. <laughs> and then he laughed again, and after that, he suddenly looked solemn. Have you been having any quarrels with wizards lately? He asked almost in a whisper, and he shut one eye and looked so friendly and so knowing out of the other one that Rover told him all about it. It was probably quite unnecessary for Pasamathos, there you go, as I told you, probably never, probably knew about it beforehand. Still, Rover felt all the more better for talking to someone who appeared to understand and had more sense than mere toys. It was a wizard, all right, said the sorcerer, when Rover had finished his tale. Old Artaxerxes. I'm gonna say Artaxerxes. <laughs> I should think of your from your description. He comes from Persia, but he lost his way one day, as even the best wizards sometimes do, unless they always stay at home, like me. And the first person he met on the road went and put him on the way to Pershore instead. He has lived in those parts except on holidays ever since. They say he is a nimble plum gatherer for an old man. 
2,000 if he is a day and extremely fond of cider. But that's neither here nor there, by which Pesamethos meant that he was getting away from what he wanted to say. The point is, what can I do for you? I don't know, said Rover. Do you want to go home? I am afraid I can't make you your proper size, at least not without asking Artaxerxes' permission first. But I don't want to quarrel with him at the moment. But I think I might venture to send you home. After all, Artaxerxes can always send you back again if he wants to. Though, of course, he might send you somewhere much worse than a toy shop next time if he was really annoyed. Rover did not like the sound of this at all, and he ventured to say that if he went back home to small, so small, he might not be recognized except by Tinker the Cat, and he did not very much want to be recognized by Tinker in his present state. Very well, said Pesam Pesamathos, we must think of something else. In the meantime, as you are real again, would you like to me something to eat? Before Rover had time to say, yes, please, yes, please, there appeared on the sands in front of him a little plate with bread and gravy and two tiny bones of just the right size, and a little drinking bowl full of water with drink puppy drink written around it in small blue letters. He ate and drank all there was before he asked, how did you do that? Thank you. He suddenly thought of adding the thank you, as wizards and people of that sort seemed rather touchy folk. But Samothos only smiled. So Rover lay down on the hot sand and went to sleep, and dreamed of bones and of chasing cats up plum trees, only to see them change into wizards with green hats who threw them enormous plums like marrows at him. And the wind blew gently all the time, and buried him almost over his head in, in the blown sand. Alright, I'm going to do a little break here. Yeah, so he ends up meeting the wizard, uh, Pusamethos, I, I guess, because he, uh, <laughs> I always, I was always saying Samethos because, like, uh, in words like, like, Psalms or whatever, or, uh, or Pterodactyl, the, the P is silent, so I thought it was one of those moments, <laughs> so I always pronounce it Samethos, but then the story says that he pronounces the P in front of it very precisely, <laughs> so I get it, I guess it is Pusamethos, which, I sure whatever it's a fantasy story <laughs> I can't really be very um <laughs> hypercritical about it because it really is just a kid's story about a toy dog so if you want to pronounce it Samothos you can go ahead and pronounce it that way <laughs> but yes he knows that this wizard Artaxerxes has pretty much enchanted him to be a toy dog until don't know when and he's just like I could do it but do I want to I don't know. How about you just have some food? There you go. <laughs> and of course, Rover being in a dog is just like, yeah, of course. <laughs> As a natural reaction of, I guess, a lot of, if not most, or all dogs would. So now we can go back into the story once again. That is why the little boys never found him. Although they, they came down into the cove, especially to look for him as soon as little boy too found he was lost. Their father was with them this time, and when they had looked and looked until the sun began to get low in tea timeish, he took them back home and would not stay any longer. He knew too many queer things about that place. Little boy too had to be content for some time after that with an ordinary three-penny toy dog from the same shop. But somehow, though he had only, only had him for a short while, he did not forget his little begging dog. At the moment, however, you can think of him sitting down very mournful in his tea, without any dog at all, while far away inland the old lady who had kept Rover and spoiled him when he was an ordinary proper sized animal was just writing out an advertisement for a lost puppy, white with black ears and answers to the name of Rover. And while Rover himself slept away on the sands and Pesamethos dozed close by with his short arms folded on his fat tummy. All right, chapter two, so I'm just gonna keep reading, so. <laughs> When Rover woke up, the sun was very low. The shadow of the cliffs was right across the sands, and Pesamethos was nowhere to be seen. Large Seagull was standing close by, looking at him, and for a moment Rover was afraid that he might he might be going to eat him. But the Seagull said, Good good evening. I have waited a long time for you to wake up. Pesamethos said that you would wake about tea time, but it is long past that now. Please, what are you waiting for me, Mr. Bird? asked Rover very politely. My name is Mew, said the seagull, and I'm waiting to take you away as soon as the moon rises along the moon's path. But we have got one or two things to do before that. Get up on my back and see how you like flying. Rover did not like it at all at first. It was all right while Mew was close to the ground, gliding smoothly along his wings, stretched out stiff and still, 
but when he shot up into the air or turned sharp from side to side, sloping a different way each time, or stooped sudden and steep as if he was going to dive into the sea, then the little dog, with the wind whistling in his ears, wished he was safe down on the earth again. He said so several times, but all that Mew would answer was, hold on, we haven't begun yet. They had been flying about like this for a little, for a little, and Rover had just began to get used to it, and rather tired of it, when suddenly, we're off, cried Mew, and Rover was n very nearly was off, <laughs> for Mew rose like a rocket steeply into the air, and then set off at a great pace straight down the wind. Soon they were so high that Rover could see far away and right over the land, the sun going down behind dark hills. They were making for some very tall black cliffs of sheer rock, too sheer for anybody to climb. At the bottom, the sea was splashing and sucking at their feet, and nothing grew on their faces, yet they were covered with white things, pale in the dusk. Hundreds of seabirds were sitting there on narrow ledges, sometimes talking mournfully together, sometimes saying nothing, and sometimes slipping suddenly from their perches to swoop and curve in the air, before diving down to the sea far below, where the waves looked like little wrinkles. This was where Mew lived, and he had several people to see, including the oldest and most important of all the of all the black-backed gulls, and messages to collect before he set out. So he set Rover down on one of the narrow ledges, much narrower than a doorstep, and told him to wait there and not to fall off. You may be sure that Rover took care not to fall off, and that with the stiff sideways wind blowing, he did not like the feeling of it at all, crouching as close as he could against the face of the cliff and whimpering. It was altogether a very nasty place for a bewitched and worried little dog to be in. At last the sunlight faded out of the sky entirely, and a mist was on the sea, and the first stars showed in the gathering dark. Then above the mist, far out across the sea, the moon rose and rose round and yellow and began to lay its shining path on the water. Soon after, Mew came back and picked up Rover, who had begun to shiver miserably. The bird's feathers seemed warm and comfortable after the cold ledge on the cliff, and he snuggled in as close as he could. Then Mew leapt into the air far above the sea, and all the other gulls sprang off their ledges and cried and wailed goodbye to them as, the, as off they sped along the moon's path that now stretched straight from the shore to the dark edge of nowhere. Rover did not know in the least where the moon's path led to, and at present he was much too frightened and excited to ask, and anyway he was beginning to get used to extraordinary things happening to them. And before I go again, I guess I can just do a little quick summary here, just very briefly, that he is now with Mew, one of the seagulls, who I guess are, he's friends with Pesamethos. <laughs> and he's just like, I guess take this dog somewhere, and uh, yeah, Rover's just like, sure, might as well, because weird things are happening to me left and right. Let's go, I suppose. And then he, <laughs> he has a terrible time on the cliffside because it's cold, and now he's being flown off again with Mew, and I guess he knows exactly where he's going. So off we go, back into the story. <laughs> as they flew along um, above the silver shimmer of the, on the sea, sorry, wow, the moon rose higher and grew whiter and more bright, until no stars dared stay anywhere near it, and it was left shining all alone in the eastern sky. No doubt Mew was going by Pesamethos' order to where Pesamethos wanted him to go, and no doubt Pesamethos helped Mew with magic, for he certainly flew faster and straighter than even the great gulls ordinarily fly, even straight down the wind when they are in a hurry. Yet it was ages before Rover saw anything except the moonlight and the sea below, and all the time the moon got bigger and bigger, and the air got colder and colder. Suddenly, on the edge of the sea, he saw a dark thing, and it grew as they flew towards it until he could see that it was an island. Over the water and up to them came the sound of a tremendous barking, a noise made up of all different kinds and sizes of barks there are, yaps and yelps and yammers and yowls, growling and grizzling, wickering and whining, snickering and snarling, mumping and moaning, and the most enormous baying, like a giant bloodhound in the backyard of an ogre. Oh, an ogre, all right. All of Rover's fur around his neck suddenly became very real again, and stood up stiff as bristles and he thought that he would like to go down and quarrel with all the dogs there at once, until he remembered how small he was. That's the Isle of Dogs, said Mew, or rather the Isle of Lost Dogs, where all the lost dogs go that are deserving or lucky. It isn't a bad place, I'm told, for dogs, and they can make as much noise as they like without anyone telling them to be quiet or throwing anything at them. They have a beautiful concert, all barking together their favorite noises, whenever the moon shines bright. 
They tell me there are bone trees there too, with fruit like juicy meat bones that drops off the tree when it's ripe. No, we are not going there just now. You see, we can't be called exactly a dog, though you are not, no longer quite a toy. In fact, Basamathos was rather puzzled, I believe, to know what to do with you when you said you didn't want to go home. Where are we going to then? asked Rover. He was disappointed at not having a closer look at the Isle of Dogs after he heard of the bone trees. Straight up, the moons pass to the edge of the world, and then over the edge and onto the moon. That's what old Pesamthos said. Rover did not like the idea of going over the edge of the world at all, and the moon looked a cold sort of place. Why to the moon, he asked. There are lots of places on the world I have never been to. I've never heard of there being bones in the moon, or even dogs. There is at least one, for, in, for the man in the moon keeps one. And since he is a decent old fellow, as well as the greatest of all the magicians, there are sure to be bones for the dog, and probably for visitors. As for why you are being sent there, I dare say you will find that out in good time, if you keep your wits about you and don't waste time grumbling. I think it is very kind of Pesamathos to bother about you at all. In fact, I don't understand why he does it. It isn't like him to do things without a good big reason, and you don't seem good or big. Thank you, said Rover, feeling crushed. It is very kind of all these wizards to trouble themselves about me, I am sure, though it is rather upsetting. You never know what will happen next, when once you get mixed up with wizards and their friends. It is very much better luck than any yapping little little pet puppy dog deserves, said the seagull, and after that they had no more conversations for a long while. Alright, I'm going to do a little break here again. Yeah, so they fly over the Isle of Dogs, and it is literally just like, it's pretty much a dog's paradise, and kind of almost like a dog heaven in a way, except they're not dead, so it's just like, any dog would love to be there. And uh, yeah, they, they're like, uh, Mule's just like, no, no, not today, maybe some other day, prob probably, I don't know, but he's just like, now we're going to go to the moon, so. So their next destination is literally the moon. Because there is a man there, you know, a man of the moon with the classic uh, stories and whatnot. So, of course, you know, man and man's best friend is a dog. So, of course, man of the moon must have one. So, that is where they're going. And we're going to go back into the story for a little bit more. The moon got bigger and brighter, and the world below got darker and farther off. At last, all of a sudden, the world came to an end, and Rover could see the stars shining up out of the blackness underneath. Far down, he could see the white spray in the moonlight where waterfalls fell over the world's edge and dropped into space. It made him feel most uncomfortably giddy, and he nestled into Mew's feathers and shut his eyes for a long, long time. When he opened them again, the moon was all laid out below them, and a new white world shining like snow with wide open spaces of pale blue and green where the tall pointed mountains threw their long shadows far across the floor. On top of one of the tallest of these, one so tall that it seemed to stab up up towards them, as Mew swept down, Rover could see a white tower. It was white with pink and pale green lines in it, shimmering as if the tower were built of millions of sea shells, still wet with foam and gleaming. And the tower stood on the edge of a white precipice, white as a cliff of chalk, but shining with moonlight more brightly than a pane of glass far away on a cloudless night. There was no path down that cliff, as far as Rover could see, but that did not matter at the moment, for Mew was sailing swiftly down and soon he settled right on the roof of the tower, at a dizzy height above the moon world that made the cliffs of the sea where Mew se lived seem low and safe. Uh, and, you know what, I think before um, go in any further, I would say that this is a good stopping point for the story, as they uh, supposedly reach the, the moon, I suppose. <laughs> so I feel like that is a good introduction to what Rover Random is kind of all about. And this might be a three-parter, probably, story. But the first one, <laughs> I guess, to kind of go over it again is, uh, yeah, it's a good starter, I feel like, for this um, story. And I wanted to at least try to start one of the smaller stories um earlier in the year so I can kind of like go down the list that I need to finish throughout the year kind of check check them off earlier than than I expected which is always really great so uh but yeah that will be all for this episode um uh just as I've said at the beginning of the episode be sure to check out uh my fantasy book called the lands of Ordia: power of heaven that is book one out of five 
And uh, yeah, currently I am a little bit, a smidge over halfway of writing the, the second book of, uh, of my series. I'm very excited because a lot of things are happening kind of they're they're amping up uh, in the second book and there's a lot more dangers a lot more characters so I would appreciate that if you guys would snag a copy so that you guys can see what happens in the second book and the rest of the series <laughs> that's kind of the main point uh, but yeah and then also again just be sure to check out the uh, the wow I was gonna say the podcast but uh, this the show called the witching hours over on YouTube. It was really, really fun being a guest on their show and to just kind of expand my my thoughts about Tolkien and his works and basing it with kind of like the spiritual side of things. So it was, it was a really good time and I greatly enjoyed it and it went, the time went by so quick, but that's that's the reason. So, But I think with all that being said, just stay tuned for another episode. And may the light of Elbereth be with you all. Farewell. <laughs>